So, uh, we're now having to into a panel session where we, we look a bit more globally. We've looked at particular themes early on today. Actually, people are coming in now. It's good. Um, so, uh, this is the part where we traditionally look at the Asian markets and, and the specific trends and opportunities they're in. Um, when we started doing PGC five years ago, uh, the East meets West uh, was all about explaining why you should be interested in China and Korea and Japan. Everybody seems to know about it, which is probably why it's not a massive audience today. But, but Asia Pacific is the, do the dominant driver now, the dominant driver of the market. Um, so China, Korea, and Japan represent three of the top five markets for mobile games. And if you add in Southeast Asia, you can combine that together into one market, even though it isn't. I think that that take, take one of the uh, the other slots as well. So the question is kind of less whether you should pay attention and, and how you can take advantage of these markets um, and the dynamics that are, that are kind of changing there. So I, I'd kick things off. Um, I'd like to uh, yeah let the panelists kind of introduce yourselves. There's, there's a lot of you, so and just quickly talk about your experience of uh, different Asian markets and, and how you're working either now or previously. So Jefferson, yeah, cover mic. Sorry. Hello. Right. My experience with Asia. Well, first I was at you know at um, you know a couple of Western companies, including EA, where I remember the year when JCK became a thing. Like we had all of our games had to be JCK. Uh, so, you know, like it, at some point it became a thing that we watched for. And then the last three years I was at uh, Bandai Namco, so I, I got to see the Japanese side of this. So I wouldn't, you know, pretend to know anything about China and Korea, but at least Japan, I was able to, you know, work for a Japanese company, go to Japan and see how the market works there, and also like running, but I was running kind of like the America mobile operations, so I was kind of be able to see, you know, how Japanese companies work and, you know, how to bring stuff to the West, you know, so at least that part of it I can talk about. Hi, um, I'm Q Lee from Gameville. Come to us. Uh, we started mobile very early so, uh, since 2000, and uh, back then I was based uh, out of South Korea. And in 2006, uh, we moved out to set up our uh, U.S. office. So it's been around uh, more than a decade now being here in the U.S. Uh, and then we also opened the office in, in Europe and also in Southeast Asia too. So I think I, I could try to provide a balanced view on, on how the East works and the West works. Cool. And I'm Paul Callan. I am uh, currently at Yamobi, which is a, a Chinese ad tech company, so very much involved in a lot of the China market. But I started with um, my time at Yahoo from 2005 to 10, actually working with a lot of the mobile OEMs. You know, remember the day when the OEMs and the carriers were ruling everything? Um, I switched from that to Zynga. I did uh, business development at Zynga and Kabam. And it was really Kabam where I started working more with uh, with uh, companies out of Seoul. And we also, of course, had offices in, in, um, in Beijing as well. So that's really where everything started to ramp up as far as my view. So I'm Michael Powers, and I work for a company called CSUN Games. It's a Chinese developer, and uh, Tencent's invested in CSUN, so we're working with them closely in China. Um, besides Chinese companies, I've also worked with companies in South Korea, bringing games over to the West. I'm Shirley, Shirley Lin. I'm currently working for a company. Uh, it's called Doggy. It's, it has nothing to do with dogs, okay? It's a discovery of game innovation, and it's a blockchain-based crypt platform for crypto games. Um, this is my second blockchain-related project in four months. I previously worked at Yamobi, and I work for an Italian company, French company, working in Asia Pacific and Europe a lot. And I also read the Chinese, so all kinds of um, stuff going on on WeChat. I read a lot of reports um, as well. And pretty much in the trench, I got a lot of stories. And if they're <laughs> recorded today, I got to be careful. Some of the stories. No, you be don't good. have to be careful. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. <laughs> but I'd be happy to share. Yeah, yeah. No, no. We've got an amazing panel. Yeah, I, um, let, let's, let's start with China then. Um, obviously, it's pretty undeniably been the engine of kind of growth for the, for the whole global uh, mobile games business. Um, and domestically, it's quite hard to get accurate forecasts one thing, but a lot of people differ on what, how much money it makes exactly, but domestically uh, the market was worth uh, in between sort of 11 and 15 uh, sorts of uh, billion uh, mobile games markets, part of a 25 to plus billion dollar overall games market, and that's focused to keep growing and growing. I guess that the first question I've got is, can you afford so I'm not used to being up here <laughs> it's a bit awkward, is, can you afford not to be in, 
in the Chinese market right now? Can you afford not to be playing in that market? Or, or, or if you're not already in there, is it almost kind of too late to be there? As two kind of separate sides separ of the same coin. Yeah, from from but then you know perspective of like uh, the. It was a big bet to go into Japan, so the company went there a few years ago, uh, started an office in Shanghai, but also made a huge partnership with Tencent. Uh, yeah, so I think pretty much, you know, also Japan and China have like similar, like the Japanese IP kind of works in China, like the same way it kind of works in Korea. So it has like um, some sort of affinity, like cultural affinity for, for IP. Uh, and, you know, but then Echo is mostly an IP company. Uh, and so I think that kind of made sense. Uh, and be, But yeah, I was seen inside the company as like a must do. Uh, yeah. Even though you know, it was, I mean, China wasn't that huge uh, a few years ago when when we went there, but uh, it was definitely seen like it just ha has to happen, and of course it has to happen with a partnership. And we we did it with Tencent. Um, it was just like we couldn't couldn't be out. Um, yeah, to my point of view, uh, I think we're kind of like semi-blocked uh, from China because uh, of the regulations uh, that, were, that have been happening. Um, I think uh, the key thing is how, um, the, it, if you really have something unique to, to provide to the market, uh, otherwise I think there's, there's pretty much all sorts of games in China, and if you're trying to do a plus uh, one strategy, there's going to be plus two and threes already out there in the market. So so I think you won't uh, be competitive at all. I think unless you have a very unique product or unless you have a strong IP, um, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, you can really stand out from the competition right now. And uh, so it's, 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 it's already become uh, very mature that even uh, for Korean companies, it's very hard to break through uh, because uh, the Tencent and the Netties uh, already have everything there. That's <laughs> okay. how I feel. So it's, a bit, it's too late kind of thing unless you've got in particular. Well, I was going to say, I don't think it's too late, but you have to be careful about it. So be very data driven. Uh, take your approach cautiously. Uh, the, the ten cent net is it's, it's true. You look at the top grossing. That's you know eight or nine out of ten is is one of those guys. Uh, but the top two hundred grossing has a lot of potential. Yeah. Um, however, you you know be be aware of where you step because it's almost the exception to do well when you're coming in from the outside. But if you do it data driven, you're careful. You choose the right partners. I think you could do well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say you have to have tempered expectations when approaching China. You're not going to just be able to go in and have your game work and be a hit as it is. You're going to have to localize it on a deep level. So, you know, please expect to do a lot of work for free to make your game work in China. Okay. I think the other side of the question is that can you afford to go into China? Right. For a lot of indie developers, I always advise what stands out, and like you mentioned, you know, it's expensive to go into China. You have to find the right partners, you go to different trade show. I always advise, just do your games well, make it happen, do it well in the Western world, in Europe, in Brazil, whatever. And if you're doing well, they're gonna come after, chase after your butt, okay? So, uh, but for larger uh, game companies, they can afford to go over sure. there. And also the regulation in China is also getting more and more scrutinized yeah. And you have to find the partners that really, they, they will say, oh, yeah, yeah, come to China. But, you know, do they have the license to get approval? The approval process is anywhere between two months to nine months for yeah. every revision of your game. So it's not that easy to go to China. If you cannot afford it, concentrate on your game, make it go well in Western world, and then think about it. Fair enough. Um, okay, now it's a very good, complete, complete answer. I'm just going to continue one more question related to, to, to China, I guess. Um, I've been going to China for about uh, eight years to, to its conferences and events and, and seeing things. And it feels to me that there's been a real evolution of the appetite, uh, consumer appetite in, in the market, where it was dominated at one point, it felt, by uh, just RPGs and Three Kingdoms strategy games. It's like and a few Western titles that had hit through. Whereas now, uh, there seems to be like a taste for indie games, uh, sort of casual games are starting to hit there. It, it's much more kind of broad. So I was going to question whether that means an opportunity for, for Western developers, and also whether, on the flip side, does that mean a, a, a potential threat? Because obviously, we, China, you know, China has massive resources. These, these, these developers, there's, there's always been a conception that they can't make Western games over there, but they are <laughs> making similar games now. So, is the appetite changing? And, and I guess second question are. Chinese uh, companies and developers are going to be coming 
for making games as close as the ones that we're kind of playing in the, in the West specifically? Well, it's the same. Uh, I'll take the stab yeah. on that. Um, it's a similar thing. So Chinese games, I have seen uh, indie games in China actually uh, are rising. Um, and a lot of them, VR game, mid-core, hardcore, yeah. they want to focus on Western also, simply because domestic markets is very much occupied or dominated by the big players. So they actually want to go Western. I've met a lot of indie developers in China. They say always say they focus on the American market or European market. Um, but they are getting better and better. So this kind of creativity and innovation original is getting more and more. However, the other part of the story, the darker side, is also very large. Um, it is dominated by, you know, everybody knows Tencent and ease And they're different. Um, they have different strategies in going, bring Chinese games out to the Western. That just doesn't work very well. The style, the, the creation, and so on and so forth. Um, but the strategy has been changing, so that's why Tencent and NetEase, both and, and CSUN, go do and Yuzu do a lot of M&A yeah. with the Western indie developers because they, for two purposes, one, to bring the creativity and innovation back to China. But the biggest, biggest uh, strategy purpose is so that they can reach out to this broader base that these successful Western games have already got that basically paved the ways for the user acquisition for other Chinese games. For example, Tencent had published, uh, what was it, uh, Emily, you probably know, and PUBG, they used tremendous, tremendous um, financial power to uh, pop their games, influencer marketing, which is ex extremely expensive. On Facebook, it's the same thing, but they have the financial power to do that. So to them, it's export. Cool. Do you have any other views on that in terms of the changing taste of, of Chinese players? or? Uh, yeah, I, th I think um, you know the top tier c companies will continue their investment into the Western territories. I think the second tier c uh, companies in China, since uh, they're facing so much uh, competition in their local market, I think they might. Um, but they have like great development talent, so I think they're they're going to start looking more and more towards uh, the West. Uh, and um, yeah, I I feel like uh, more uh, there's going to be more uh, Chinese advancement uh, coming out to the West. But right now, I think they've been so focused on their local battles yeah. uh, is uh, what we're seeing right now. And they're also going to Southeast Asia and Brazil. Yeah, no, I, I think when, when mm -hmm. I talk to Chinese companies, they say they're mm -hmm. going abroad. It's often they mean to, you know, overseas, they mean Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's, let's turn attention, uh, Q, to, 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 you know, the market you know more about than anyone here, probably. I mean, um, Korea's one of the big five markets. And I think historically, again, from the time we've been in the space, uh, the Korea's always been sort of trailblazers really. They had the earliest kind of penetration, the smartphones were kind of there more advanced earlier. And, and the, 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 there's always been innovation. So I guess, uh, what are the latest trends that you see coming out of Korea and is there something that we should be watching and, and kind of learning from at the moment? Um. Yeah, so, so Korea is becoming a very, very tough market. Um, all the traditional PC uh, gaming game developers, uh, they fully transitioned into uh, mobile now. And um, if you look at the top charts, uh, they're all PC game developers. Uh, we're one of the f the only <laughs> uh, uh, pure, pure mobile developer. Uh, I think that's still barely surviving in our local market. And uh, right now, our, for us, you know, it's that's why I mentioned like the, the second tier. Uh, companies, you know, like for us, our revenue source have, has been more focused com on coming from the West uh, rather than from our local market. Right. Um, there's con there's there's also been a lot of consolidation towards the top uh, companies in Korea, and uh, so it's it's basically the top companies and the indie developers that are surviving, who operate on uh, on big bets or low low bet. Uh, so low middle, middle's been yeah, squeezed. middle middle's been squeezed. Uh, so yeah. middle has disappeared appeared right now um, and so I think there's going to be more Korean developers who are willing to work in in the West. Okay. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, they're 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 going to be trying to find new markets. You know, I think that's why there's a lot of uh, attention towards like the new messenger games, uh, the new blockchain uh, technology uh, that's been happening uh, in in Korea. Yeah. Does anybody else got anything specifically in the Korean 
Well, just reflexively, and it has a little bit to do with the former founders of Kabam that I worked with. They're big into esports and based a team out of Seoul. Um, so that's one one area that I think you just generically hear, oh, the, you know, Korea is esports. And I know it's far much more than that, but I am curious to see how that is going to progress. Yeah. Um, I was at uh, uh, another conference, and I think the stat was if you look at professional sports teams like NFL, they monetize uh, on a regular basis. They just put a number out there. Each fan is monetized at about 50 dollars whereas esports is about five dollars so that's why there's a lot of money moving into esports yeah viewing live events and seeing where they can go and I think Korea is a big part of it yeah yeah no, no Korea is definitely being ahead of the game in multiplayer and, and, and esports there um, just about one final question on Korea because I think it's interesting um, talking about instant messenger and, 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 and social generally um, Kakao a couple of years ago was you know the model for, for, for how these kind of uh, social platforms could could you know dispute and, and control sort of gaming I mean I think at one point Point, like nine out of ten games were cacao versions of the same game with the chart. Is that is that still the same? Are, are they? I mean, were those games? You know, where do they stand compared to like Facebook Instant Messenger? Now are they are they doing something similar? Or so I, I think when they first started, uh, the market was still early. So um, uh, there were a lot of first time gamers on the platform. However, um, the gaming business is is much more dependent on return uh, returning customers uh, nowadays. And I think the power of uh, cacao has diminished uh, significantly uh, these days. Um, I think they might try uh, an, another entry into the market, maybe in do new market forms or new uh, uh, new HTML type of forms. But I think the current business model uh, uh, isn't isn't hasn't been uh, successful uh, in the past year. So to give you an update on what's happening. Okay, no, that's 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 cool. Um, Let's let's switch across to we'll probably come back to China. But switch across to J J Japan for a second. I don't know if anybody's uh, well. I know uh, Jefferson obviously have some experience obviously working in Japan for Japanese company. Uh, it, it remains the, the very strong market, arguably the, the, the strongest in terms of kind of revenue still, um, and it's continuing to grow. It's significantly outgrew the U.S. market on both iOS and Android last year, uh, and, and users are very engaged. I was reading a stat that that, that apps. Uh, Access twice as much, almost twice as much, and, and certainly more than twice as long than than, than pl the players in uh, in the West. Um, but it's quite a unique space. Is 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 there an opportunity for, for Western companies in Japan, or is it pretty much a kind of closed shop? Because it's it's a very the, the culturally certainly it feels harder to to access than maybe Korea uh, as it stands. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think, like, from the West, like, we often look at the Japan and, like, what, right? So I think that there, <laughs> there is that sense, uh, for sure. Um, you know, in, in terms of, like, what works, I think, you know, each company that does success, like, uh, has success in, in Japan does it a little differently. But, you know, like, Bandai Namco was always about IP and, you know, just uh, all the anime and, like, manga and stuff. And, like, I think that's one of the... The strengths of the company, where the company is built around those IP, and it's built to get the new ones as it, they grow, like they get them and then you know make them into games. So I think it, it was all built around that um, kind of culture, and that's why it's so successful. Like, and that's why like many of the games don't work outside of Japan, uh, you know, with the exception of like Dragon Ball and like yeah. some, some of the other games like do well. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a very you know local strategy that works really well there. But you know that's why like when when going outside to Japan or sorry to China and U.S. and Korea, like the uh, the IP helps in the beginning because you know Gundam is huge and you know Southeast Asia etc. But it doesn't work here. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay, it was in Ready Player One, I guess. But then it it it's, 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 uh, <laughs> it would I'm sure it's gonna get bigger over time. But it, it's not the, the same advantage as it, as it is there. Yeah. So yeah, there needs to, like something else needs to happen uh, for it to go outside. But uh, to going into Japan, I mean, you really got to understand because it's such a crazy. I mean, you can do things there. It's so dense. Like it's a it's a small country with so many people. Like you know, it's the only place where I've seen where you know, like you can literally drive a truck with your ad around town and actually hit ten and million people. That's a, U, that's a US strategy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It hits ten million people right wow. in a day. You can you can give out like a, I was always you know learning best practices with the team in Japan. They're like, oh yeah, we hand out flyers in Shibuya. And I'm like, what? And it actually works because it hits like 10 million people, right? Like yeah. it's, it's the things that like it would 
would never work anywhere else. But uh, so that's why I think it's so unique. Like there's um, a lot of things about about it which are different. So if you want to be successful there, you really gotta understand. Uh, and yeah, if you can find some IP, even the Western IP that works, like you know, um, Avatar when it came out was here in Japan. But yeah. I think it was mostly because it was a tech, like a treaty thing. That's kind of they're also very kind of early adopters of stuff. So they looked at it. Oh, it looks cool, and you know. But you know, the next movies, I, I don't think they're gonna do that well compared to the first one. So I think yeah, it's hard. It's hard to kind of reproduce. Disney now, isn't it? So we'll see. <laughs> different, different house. Yeah. Um, one thing I did notice looking around at the charts in, in, in Japan, and, and this might be true uh, again for access uh, approaches to, to, to Asian markets, is that hyper casual kind of games are really, you know, like kind of stuff that kind of uh, mini clip or catch up are doing seems to be working there. Um, you know, they seem to be kind of getting through. You, you look at the charts, it's all Japanese brands, but then if you look at the uh, kind of casual kind of download charts, you see things like kind of Slither IO and, and um, uh, Cooking Fever, I saw Rolling Sky, Candy Crush. There's, there's, there's games there. Which seem to be breaking through, and is that is that true for are those kind of hyper casual titles got a better chance of, of hitting in, in, in Asia? You know, because you don't maybe you don't need to do as much culturalization. You don't need to. Yeah, do the, the one thing I think uh, that Japan has that makes it easy for like those phenomena to happen is that they're very much like trend people. So like when some when somebody's playing a game, like the whole country is playing that game. So like so when when something catches, it really catches. Yeah. So I think those games are more. So just get your game to catch. That's your tip. Yeah, exactly. It's so, so easy. Well, right? well that's pretty easy. Then well, you know, <laughs> every, every, every can do that. But okay. No, no. I, I was, it was in sharp. But I, it, these things are easier to catch on fire. So I think from that point of view, like you know, it, it's 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 easier for them to like be be a thing than if they were like a more involved game. Yeah. So either IP or something that you know it's very accessible. But it really depends on like you know people playing because you know they, they they really like you know everybody's playing the same thing on the train and you know they, they talk about it and then so they save their money and they have like this monthly stipend that they spend on games and yeah. you know they always put on the game of the month so I think there's this effect where there's a particular like everybody's aiming their promotions for that day when people get the the, the money and so. Yeah. Is, is there is there anything particular from Japan or, or, or China or Korea, any, any of the markets we're kind of looking at so far that that we really should be looking at as Western game developers and, and, and can, can learn from? I mean, things you know, Japan's kind of given us so, so much in terms of kind of trends and kind of uh, you know sort of gacha and crazy amazing kind of characters and and and, and you know I think the the way that the, the China's lives ops is really interesting and, and multiplayer sort of esports evolved in Korea. Is there anything? That's going on at the moment right now that Western developers need to look at and go right. This is something that's gonna that's gonna break over here, or this is something that you should start trying to implement in your games. Crypto games. Crypto games. <laughs> <laughs> is, crypt, well, is, is crypto big in, in, in Asia? Chinese people love to make money. Crypto game gives them the opportunity to make the money. Even if you have two Ethereum or one Bitcoin or have Bitcoin, okay. you can play crypto game. It gives people the hope that you may get money instead of your money being sucked by in the traditional other. Okay. <laughs> so that's why next door is RAM. Is that what we're saying? Yes. People, crypto is the thing. Okay, well, yeah. interesting. It's but totally it, very different game design also. I, I guess it's, it's, but is crypto, is, is, I mean, I, I, at the moment, I, I, ICO has been banned in China and, and, and Korea. No, you don't have to do ICO. No, okay. <laughs> crypto games don't need to go ICO. Crypto games. You don't necessarily We've have to. We've got the, the crypto side. The, is, is anybody else here got a feeling on crypto games? We, we can take it there. Uh, well, I, I was going to mention uh, MMORPGs, uh, which are huge in all Asian territories right now. I think um, uh, in the West right now, besides uh, Clash Royale and a couple of other games, uh, I, I, I still haven't seen a lot of uh, real-time um, based gaming, yeah. I think, uh, which is going to become ma mainstream for sure, uh, if, if, if it isn't. Uh, and um, MMORPGs uh, with uh, like hundreds of people on, on a single server playing simultaneously has been a huge thing, so I well, think that shoot, will come. There's hundreds of people shooting each other, or 100 people shooting each other at the moment. It's quite popular. Right. That seems to be the right. the new black right now in, 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 the, in, the, in the industry. Are you talking about mobile or PC? Yeah, mobile, yes. Mobile MMR? Yes, mobile, mobile MMR PCs. Okay. okay. That's so got to be outside China, then. 
Yeah, it's called yeah. Merge. Right? <laughs> I was just talking about tips <laughs> that are happening elsewhere. Um, I, w I want to ask a question about kind of localization. A lot of people say, um, you know, obviously you've got to localize your game for if you're trying to hit the market. That's pretty obvious. But what does that actually kind of mean? It's an easy word to throw around. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got to have the, you know, the language needs to be right on the, you know, the, 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 the grammar, spelling, the, the visual style, I, I guess. You need to take cues and, and cultural references. Is, is there, you know, how, how deep... How, how deep does it do you need to do? do you, I mean, can you localize a Western game and kind of push it out there? Or is that that ship kind of sailed a little bit? Mm -hmm. I'll just jump in. I, I, it used to be that you had to localize. You had to be very, very much tuned to the market. I can try. If you weren't, if you weren't going at almost as a Chinese game, it was challenging. But now you looked at Traveling Frog. You look at the rise of casual games. There's a real opportunity there. So it's not necessarily localizing down to. I mean, obviously language, everything else you have to get right. Although oh, Traveling Frog didn't. Um, but then you 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 look at what like our model right now is we'll take in a game for our China publishing program. We'll do some very subjective but rigorous testing, and if it passes that, we think oh, this is a good bet. We'll then do a, a free soft launch on it just to really look at the okay. metrics and become more data driven on it. If that all works out and lines up really well, then then it's it's useful for the partner, useful for, for us. Can't beat a free soft launch. That's, uh, that's no. Good. Yeah, it's 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 pretty nice because you get the you get the data. You can't beat real data. And once you have that, then you know all right this this has promise. Let's start making the changes and let's dive into it fully. Okay. I would say if you're going to work with a very large publisher in China, you're going to have to expect to localize, you know, on, on a deeper level, talking about like reward frequency, uh -huh. changing your monetization, mm -hmm. maybe even adding additional game systems. Yes. And you might be expected to do this for free before they're willing to work with you. So you got to keep that in mind also. Right. Yeah, that's certainly how we release our games in, in China. We have a separate office, like we send the games there and then they yeah. work on it. Mm -hmm. and then they, they, they go out later, yeah. like we don't like we don't even try to do it from yeah. here like we just yeah. give it to them your list of things you just don't touch okay no violence no not too much blood no porn politically cor correct and plus a gameplay also because it's a very different gameplay in China and you have to do something on the server so you don't get hacked yeah. on the client side oh, yeah that's a thing. great point mm -hmm. okay um, uh, it's very hard to talk about this, but I think it's in, 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 I mean, like, Southeast Asia is massive and diverse. It's a bit like going, like, Europe, which is going for a while at the moment. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's not one place, but it, it is, um, together as a, as a market, it's huge. Um, I guess, in broad brush, brush strokes, within, you know, looking at kind of from Singapore and Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, where where are the kind of the big opportunities there right now? Where are the lowest hanging fruit? Is, 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 are there particular markets, particular games, particular niches that, you know, are open right now in, in that space? Because it is very rapidly growing. It hasn't been as oversaturated as other, other markets, perhaps. Um, which, that's where the Chinese and then oh, Koreans Indonesia, sure. Philippines. Yeah. They're the first one, especially Indonesia. They love social games when first book got in. But these S, uh, Southeast Asia, their payment is not that good. Yeah. You know, because it's an underdevelopment, sort of developing countries. However, you can get a huge amount of players Engagement. that you can do a good t test and monetize with advertising, you know, yes. especially for mobile games. So, so They're not going to pay for a lot of in-game virtual goods kind of thing, but advertising, 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 because okay. they don't really mind watching a lot of advertising yeah. videos, especially playable, so that they can get points to advance. So yeah. that's pretty much the casual. So it's that kind of casual yes. ad funded games yes. working quite well. Yeah, I mean that works the same thing in, in Southeast Asia, Brazil, yeah. and in Africa, okay. you know, or any of these uh, developing countries. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kabam, we used uh, the Philippines and Indonesia a lot for soft launches. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you won't track the IAP percentage, but you really can track all the other KPIs, the retention, the overall engagement you have. And then, of course, at Yamobi, yeah, yeah I, I fully agree, Shirley. Uh, the advertising opportunity is really good. You can drive to scale and uh, and get a lot of money through advertising. So I think it's, it's a worthy area to go into. Like you said, it's not oversaturated. And even the, the bigger guys will use it just to test out the games. Yeah. Um, I think for us, the revenues coming from Singapore and Thailand has always been the biggest. I think uh, in terms of market maturity and how well Google um, Google Play and iOS App Store is penetrating, uh, I think those two markets are the, I think, closest to the, Singapore is probably going to look the closest to the Western charts uh, that you're seeing. Um, 
in terms of potential, I think if you go by the population, I think uh, Indonesia and Vietnam uh, would also have uh, great potential. However, as Shirley mentioned, uh, I think the pe the payments are not there. Uh, so I think you're just scratching a small part of the market uh, if you want to go all in there. So I would. I would expect Vietnam to grow uh, quicker uh, than Indonesia right now, and uh, yeah, so my my choice would be focus on Singapore first, and then if you have the resources to localize to Thai, Thai then maybe go to Thailand. Uh. Taiwan also. Taiwan is very. Yeah, close. yeah Taiwan is yeah. huge. Ta mm -hmm. I, I wasn't considering Taiwan. <laughs> we so at our company we categorize Taiwan separate from Southeast Asia. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 No, that's that's that's. Fair play. Um, okie dokie. Um, I guess spinning things around, um, and uh, despite the massive domestic growth, or perhaps because of the domestic uh, competition, uh, the big Asian companies are seem very keenly interested in, in, in the Western Western market, Western companies. Um, uh, I think in the last year, Tencent particularly was responsible for like, like ten four dollars out of every ten spent on, on game uh, investment. And then you've obviously got NetEase, Yuzu, Netmarble, a host of other companies. Um, do, do you think that's going to continue? Do you think that trend is going to continue? Is that, you know, that's, that's certainly for the last, it's been pretty consistent for the last year. Um, um, you know, and, and, and do you think that's going to continue? And also, do you think there's going to be more companies looking to be truly kind of global? It's something a couple of Chinese companies said to me recently. We're a, we're a global company now. Is that is that a trend we should we should look for uh, going forward? I, I, I'll just go with what Shirley said earlier. The Chinese like to make money. <laughs> So you know, throwing that one out there, I mean, you, you, I think you'll see that trend continue. Uh, there's there's big conglomerates that weren't even in gaming that suddenly buy gaming because they want the profitability from it. Uh, but I think the, the the smarter ones are looking at what the opportunities are globally and what what moves they can make. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I, I've been being in charge of some of the M and A cases, and I think a Chinese company do have a lot of problems integrating when they uh, acquire Western companies. Tencent's been doing pretty good, but they have learned hard lessons. So they're pretty much hands-free because they acquire so many. Anyway, I think in between 2016 to 2017, they do average of five per week. Wow. Yeah. Equity or M&A. Yes. So they don't have time. They just have to let go free. But otherwise, I don't want to mention the name. They have problems integrating. So yeah. they are still learning to be global. Yeah. They want to be global, but they are still learning hard ways. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah, I would say also that you know all large Chinese companies want to be large worldwide companies. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they have a mandate to expand. Yeah. And M&A is their best way. And also M&A is their best way of making games that might appeal to the global audience. Because of how games are made in China, you know, they kind of maybe rush into something yeah. before planning it out as much. So they have right. some problems on the creative side. So mm -hmm. they might think it's easier, oh, we can just acquire this other company. Yeah. And that can give us the creativity we need to expand internationally. And also to penetrate the markets there, the user base. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. I same in Korea. I, I don't think any entrepreneur in Korea says I'm going to be the best company in Korea. I'm, they all want to be the best company globally. Uh, so they have huge ambitions. I think uh, compared to the Chinese hands-off approach, I think most Korean companies would um, want to be very hands-on also yeah. and globally integrated uh, is the difference that I I may see. Okay. No, no, no. Chinese company hands-on. That's just ten cents. Not the rest of them. Okay. So, the just to close, um, I, I guess I'd just like a quick one recommendation from each of you. For, for if you're a Western developer, mid-size indie maybe, um, and, and, and considering the considering looking at Asia, thinking you want to do something there, what would be what is is it is it focusing on a specific region? Is it a particular strategy? Is it something else? Don't. I mean, what is the what would be your one kind of uh, sort of piece of advice? I guess. Um, my advice would be try to be yourself as much as possible. Don't try to be Asian. Um, I think it's just, it works <laughs> the other way around too. So if you get lucky, like as an Asian, um, you might 
uh, be successful and make a California roll, but I think bringing out sushi it, is the best uh, way to approach this market. So, uh, yeah, I, I, as it, it, I think it works the other way too. Uh, trying to be yourself and trying to be original uh, works is is the best strategy um, to to uh, penetrate the East, in my opinion. Cool. Yeah. I would say if you're going to work with a, a Chinese partner and you take their money, you're going to be working for them. So keep that in mind. So, you know, coming to China or Asia, it's not a magic pill. It's a lot of hard work. But if you if you're willing to put the work in, you know, you can make a lot of money. Yeah, the, the speed in China, um, entrepreneurs, especially in gaming, in anything VR or crypto gaming, um, I give a new term, it's called CES, it's Chinese entrepreneur speed. It's so fast comparing to the Western speed. Yeah. So when you work with them, except when they do M&A, sometimes they kind of drag on their feet. But, you know, like, you know, you said, to build the relation, you might still meet some of the Chinese companies, build their relationship, but even though you're not for forming the partnership right now, still, but be tolerant about their English level, that kind of things, and continue building that relationship and work with partners who know how to penetrate in the China market and give you good advices, although that can be, you know, a little bit tough a challenge, but, you know, again, if you work on your own, do pretty well in the Western market, they'll come after you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to add on to that. I, I would say building the relationship is very important. So uh, look for the relationship. People are actually going to work with you. Uh, if you're mid-sized India, I think is your example, then you also want to make sure you're getting the right data. You find a path to where you're not just going to throw money or accept, uh, accept you know, someone buying you and giving you MG. You're going to have to work hard at that. Uh, if you're not, if it's not panning out, you may be ignored at that point. You're being told to do a lot, but just ignored, not given a lot of marketing love. So find the right partner. Find the people that are going to work with you on the relationship side, and definitely watch, you know, let data drive where you're going to go. Excellent. Any, any more? Are we done? Jefferson, any final thought? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, you know, I, I just tried to come back to, like, what Q said. Like, it's, it's basically, you know, try to stand out, and I think that's the, only, the your best shot. Uh, like, I mean, the... Yeah, I mean, if you just try to follow the, the formulas or whatever, and you might end up in the middle of the other hundreds, um, unless you have the power of, you know, being a big company or have like a big backer or something. But if you're small, then probably your best bet is just try to stand out, um, whether by the art style or, you know, the whatever you're trying to do, like try to be different. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much. Can I have an applause, please, for my amazing panel? Thank you very much.